Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives, and follow us uh, on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Well, before we do get started, I do want to encourage you to check out store.greatdetectives.net where you can find all of my ebooks, such as What Made the Golden Age Shine and All I Needed to Know I Learned from Columbo. Also, audiobooks and paperbacks, including Slime Incorporated, my first ever detective novel at store.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for our very last episode of Nick Carter. The original air date is December the 25th, Christmas Day, 1949, and the title is The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter. The Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser and Delrich, is happy to bring you today's Nick Carter adventure transcribed. This was done so that everyone connected with this program would be able to spend Christmas Day at home with their families. And now... New wonderful Old Dutch Cleanser, the only cleanser made with activated seismatite, invites you to stand by for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's Nick Carter adventure starring Lon Clark, The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter, brought to you by New Wonderful Old Dutch Cleanser. It is mid-afternoon as Sergeant Matheson and Nick Carter in a speeding police car turn into a street of cheap rooming houses. Uh, you can understand, Nick, that Warren's specialty shop can't stand losing all those expensive fur coats, even if it is a big woman's store. You sure it's the work of shoplifters? Sure. And we think Peggy Matthews, the girl we're going to see, is one of the shoplifters. Mm -hmm. Any reason to pin it on her? Well, one of the store detectives spotted her in the store this afternoon, but she got away from him. But after she left, another fur coat was gone... He just found out where she lives, huh? Yeah. We learned who she was from a beautiful set of fingerprints she left on the plastic case she'd been handling. So I got a warrant to pick her up on suspicion. How many fur coats have they lost, Matty? Oh, a dozen or more, Nick. Each of them worth over 3,000 bucks. Hey, quite a loss. Yeah. Must have been mink, huh? They were. What do you want? What? Well, who are you? This is my rooming house. I'm the landlady. We want to see Peggy Matthews. Eh, what do you want Peggy for? Take a look at this badge. <laughs> Couple of flat feet. Whoa, yo, yo. Okay, second floor, turn right into the hall. Well, that's better. Come on, Nick. Right with you. I hope you fall and break your head. Thanks. He said turn right at the top of the stairs. Yeah. This must be the room. Ooh. I don't hear anything, Nick. Well, with this warrant, we can go right in. Hey, door is unlocked. Great Scott. Oh. Someone moved faster than we did, Matty. She's been strangled with one of her own nylon stockings. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter, today's adventure with Nick Carter. Maybe you were up way past midnight last night, trimming the tree, wrapping last-minute packages, planning wonderful surprises to greet your youngsters when they hopped out of bed at dawn this morning. You see... Christmas does get here, even though the youngsters think it's slow in coming. And you do somehow manage to get your thousand and one extra jobs done in time. And isn't it wonderful? Right now, chances are you're all together, the whole kit and caboodle of you, with your Christmas tree lights glimmering in the twilight, your radio turned on. A perfect opportunity for us to bring you this special message. The makers of Old Dutch Cleanser are happy indeed for the privilege of bringing these radio programs into your home throughout the year. Happy, too, that Old Dutch Cleanser itself is a trusted and helpful friend in so many of your homes. We hope you've all had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas Day, never to be forgotten. Now, back to The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. 
Nick and Matty are back in the murdered girl's room after unsuccessfully searching the house for the killer. Several men from the homicide squad have just arrived and are going to work as Patsy Bowen hurries in. I came as fast as I could, Nick. Oh, you didn't tell me it was a murder. Uh, we called you, Patsy, because we thought this needed a, a woman's touch. Oh? Yeah, this dead woman is Peggy Matthews, Patsy. Uh-huh. She's a shoplifter who was seen acting suspiciously in the Warren Specialty Store this afternoon, just before another mink coat disappeared. Is this the coat here on the chair? No, we found that one in a clothes closet. Uh, she bought it a month ago in a small fur shop downtown. Now there's a label in the coat, and we phoned the store to check it. She paid $400 for it. 400 for this rabbit skin? Yeah. Oh, she got stuck, but good. That's why I wanted you to see it, Betsy. I needed your opinion. Oh. Hey, Nick. Look, I've been thinking. Maybe we ought to bring the manager of the fur department of Warren's specialty shop down here to look at her, just to be sure this is the girl he saw, huh? Good idea, Maddie. Come on, Patsy. We'll bring her back here as soon as we can, Maddie. <laughs> So this girl was murdered before you could talk to her, eh, Mr. Carter? That's right, Mr. Dodd. You sure you recognize her again? Oh, yes. This particular girl snooped around the fur department for some time. Although I didn't see her take anything. But you kept an eye on her. I'm afraid I didn't. You see, I was very busy with Miss Robard. Miss Robard? She's a fashion expert on one of the women's magazines, isn't well, she? That's right. Oh. Too bad this girl is dead, Mr. Carter. One of our most expensive fur coats was missing right after she left the store. Maybe she could have told us what happened to it. Well, if we want to know where that coat went, we'll have to find out some other way, Mr. Dodd. The final curtain has fallen for Peggy Matthews. Well, uh, Mr. Dodd, is this the woman you saw in your department store this afternoon? Yes, Sergeant, I'm certain of it. No question at all. Uh-huh. Well, okay, Mr. Dodd, and thanks for coming down. Oh, Patsy and I will run you back to the store, Mr. Dodd. We want to get a full description of the stolen coats anyway. Uh, can we leave at once, Mr. Carter? You see, Miss Robot is waiting for me to get back. We've been in conference all afternoon, but there's still a lot left to do. Sure, sure. We'll leave in just a moment. Hey, Matty. Yeah, Nick? Did you dig up anything where we were going? Well, just one thing, Nick. The landlady broke down, uh, <clears throat> finally, told me that Bruno Seeley has come here to see Peggy a couple of times recently. Bruno Seeley, eh? That's a smart character. I'll have a talk with him shortly. Oh, uh, Mr. Dodd, would you give me your expert opinion as to the value of this fur coat? It belonged to Peggy. Hmm. He didn't shoplift that from our store, Miss Bourne. I'd roughly guess it was worth about $150. Uh-huh. Well, Nick, I guess I'm a fairly good judge of fur values. Patsy means that she told us Peggy Matthews was cheated when she paid $400 for this coat, Mr. Dodd. You just backed up her opinion. I see. Well, I don't think Miss Matthews minds being cheated anymore. Shall we go? Miss Bourne, Mr. Carter, this is Audrey Robard, the fashion expert I told you about. Hello, Miss Robard. How do you do? How do you do, Miss Robard? I, uh, I'm familiar with your work in the magazines. Lovely. Why, thank you, Miss Bowen. Oh, Nick, just look at all these gorgeous fur coats hanging on the racks here. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Dodd, tell me, just how many coats have shoplifters taken from this store? Why, uh, I can't say exactly. I, I don't have the figures. Are the prices on the coats? I mean, could anyone tell they were getting the best just by looking at the price tags? No, no, indeed. Each coat is marked with a code number. Only the sales lady knows what it sells for. And you have no idea how the coats were smuggled out of here? None at all, Mr. Carter. The store detectives assigned to this department have spotted shoplifters dawdling about, followed them to the street, and stopped them. But although we found a number of stolen items, there wasn't a single fur coat. Well, I don't think you're too careful with your coats, Mr. Dodd. All the time we've been talking, there's been a lovely coat lying right there on that display table with no one near it. Oh, that's my coat, Miss Bowen. I threw it down there as I came in. And it's not as nice as it looks from here. Oh, well. well you've had it a good many years, Audrey. Nothing lasts forever. <laughs> How right you are. Uh, Mr. Carter, why don't you go up and see Mr. Warren, the owner of the store? He might be able to tell you things I couldn't. Yeah, good idea. Is he here? Well, it's almost closing time, but I'm sure he's here. He never leaves until later than this. His office is upstairs, fourth floor in the rear. Good. I'll go see him. We need every scrap of information we can get. Sit down, 
down. Sit down, both of you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. I don't mind telling you, Mr. Carter, how glad I am that you're helping us. Tell me, Mr. Warren, just how many coats have been stolen? Fifteen. And the cheapest of them retail for $3,100. Oh, say, they really made a haul, didn't they? Over $50,000, Miss Bowen. Golly. Your store detectives haven't seen anything suspicious? Well, there is one rather odd thing. What's that? Lately, we seem to be attracting an unusual number of professional shoplifters. Many of them are known to our detectives. But they haven't caught them with anything? Well, just small miscellaneous items, Miss Bowen. Never anything really valuable. There's no way of smuggling the coats out to a crooked employee, perhaps. Absolutely not, Mr. Carter. Why, we've checked that thoroughly. Yet we're completely at a loss to know how the coats get out of the store. Well, thanks, Mr. Warren. Oh, not at all, Mr. Carter, not at all. Now, please don't hesitate to call on me for any sort of help at any time. I will. And we may have news for you soon. Good. we got one clue that may lead us somewhere. In fact, we're going to see the man in question right now. Ah, this is the place, Nick. Sealy's Bargain Outlet. So that's what he called it. Uh, Wonder how legitimate a business it really is. Well, Bruno's already done one stretch as a fence for stolen goods. If anybody's in the position to direct a shoplifter's ring, Bruno Sealy's the man. Well, Matty, come on. Let's see what he has to say. All right. Nick, all the fur coats that were stolen were the very best quality, weren't they? According to Mr. Warren, they were. Mm-hmm. But, Nick, if Peggy Matthews got chipped on the coat she bore for herself, how would she know enough to pick out a really good one? The prices weren't on the coat. Hey, that's a very good thought, Betty. If Peggy got cheated so badly when she bought her own fur coat, it's proof she didn't know good furs from bad. Hey, that's right. Oh, oh, Patsy, it takes a woman to notice a clue like that. And if I'm right, Peggy had nothing to do with stealing any of those coats. Not unless someone pointed out the good ones to her first. Yeah, Nick. Well, come on, let's go in and see if Sealy can throw some light on this. <clears throat> Hello. Anybody here? Hello. That's funny. Hey, Bruno. Bruno! Hey, Bruno! Maybe he's in the back room. Yeah, could be. Hey, the back room's empty, too. What's that? Sounds like somebody in pain. It's coming from inside that closet. Great Scott, it's Bruno. He's been stabbed. He's badly. Listen, Just a minute. He's trying to tell us something. Can't Bruno, I'm Nick Carter. Who stabbed you? I don't know his name. Not his real name. I... Uh, yes, Bruno. See, Marge Panet. Go see Marge Panet. Marge Barnett. In, All right, Bruno. In my pocket. Key. Post office box. Clark Street Station. Package. Nick, I better call an ambulance. That won't be necessary, Matty. He's dead. <laughs> Nick and Matty are faced with a second murder. We'll see what happens in just a moment. There are no words for Christmas. The wreath of holly on your front door, the mistletoe, the glow of candles in your window. Yes, and the stately Christmas tree, brilliant with lights, shimmering with tinsel. The dinner... The gifts and gay wrappings, all these are merely frosting on the cake. Outward symbols of the deep inner meaning Christmas really has for us. There are no words for Christmas. Just as there are no words for the love you feel for a a tousle-haired youngster. The joy you feel with a close friend. The warmth you feel when you say Merry Christmas. May this day be so filled with everything fine, everything good that you'll never forget a single golden moment of it. That's the Christmas wish to you from the makers of famous old Dutch cleanser. (laughs) 
Now, back to The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. After summoning the Homicide Squad to take over at Bruno's store, Matty, Nick, and Patsy have hurried to the Clark Street branch of the post office, where they have just opened Bruno's post office box. Well, yeah, there's a package here, but it don't weigh anything. Well, open it up, Sergeant. Yeah, that's what Bruno wanted us to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, will you look at this? Well, what in the world is it, Sergeant? Ah, a string of beads string from the of Warren beads. Specialty Shop. And the price tag says only $15. Yeah, I don't get it. Hey, let me see that wrapper, will you? Yeah, sure. Enough. This package was postmarked early this afternoon at a postal substation near the Warren store. And this necklace was stolen from that store today and mailed to Bruno. Yeah, probably from a mailbox right in the store. Warren to the branch post office on the fourth floor. Say, it's a smart idea. You nab something small, have an envelope all addressed, you just slip the loot inside, seal it, and mail it. Yeah, but what has all this to do with stolen fur coat? I don't know, Patsy. But we can be sure of one thing, Nick. The murders of Peggy and Bruno are tied up together somehow. And to one man, Matty. Bruno said it was a man, but we didn't know who he was. Just who is this Marge Barnett Bruno wanted us to see? She used to be a pretty good confidence woman, Patsy. Confidence woman? Yeah, yeah Patsy. Lots of these confidence and women turn to shoplifting when they begin losing their nerve or their looks. Look, I can get her address from our records, Nick. And you and Patsy can go and see her. Huh? Sure, Matty. I'm going back to Bruno Seeley's store. I want to finish my report. Okay, Matty. Patsy and I'll see Marge Barnett. We better hurry because the murderer may have the same idea. <laughs> Oh, Nick, this is Marge Barnett's apartment. Here's the name below the bell. Hope she's home. Well, the police certainly keep an up-to-date file on crooks, don't they? Sergeant Matheson got this address for us in only a few minutes. Yeah, Patsy. People only knew how... Yes? Hello, Marge. I, I beg your pardon. Am I supposed to know you? I know you. You must have slipped to turn to shoplifting. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter. Oh, Nick Carter, huh? Well... What do you want? Shall we talk out here in the hall where everybody can listen? Oh, come on in. Snooping coppers give me a pain. Thanks. This is Patsy Bourne, my assistant. Hmm. Trying to make a cop out of her, too? You ought to be ashamed. Why, I like it. Marge, Bruno's dead. Bruno dead? He was murdered, Marge. So was Peggy Matthews. <laughs> Who did it? Suppose you tell me. Oh. Goodbye, Carter. I'm not talking about nobody. Now, wait, Marge, wait. Bruno was stabbed. When we found him, he still had a few seconds to live, and the last thing he told us was to come and see you. Bruno said that, did he? He did. I wonder why. Maybe he was trying to save your life. Hey, come on, tell me, how'd you get into this anyway? Oh, I'm getting old, Carter. As you know, I've been everything from a cheap shill to the operator of a big store. From the best roper he ever saw to a plain subway dealer. You've been what? In English, Patsy. She means she fronted for con men and rose to become the operator of an important con man, con game herself. She worked from the top as the smart, pretty girl who brings in the suckers. Being a subway dealer means she was reduced to dealing cards from the bottom of the deck. Well, it sounds almost fascinating, if I could understand it. How many of these small, inexpensive items did you steal, put into a package, and mail to Bruno, Marge? So you're wise to that, huh? I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, it was. Until fur coats and murder got mixed up in it. Uh, where do fur coats come in? Look, Bruno paid you to steal these small articles for him. And paid you more than you could get anywhere else, didn't he? Yeah. He said he had a particular customer for a lot of that junk. All right. Just what orders did he give you? Well... I never did understand it, Carter. We were supposed to show up at Warren's specialty shop at a certain time and just wander around. Did those instructions include visiting the fur department? Why, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, we had to pass through the fur department on our way to the counter where this certain kind of glass junk was sold. And you, uh, lingered in the fur department. What woman wouldn't? She's got a point there, Nick. Yeah. And this business is getting a little clearer. Well... So help me, that's everything I know. Well, thanks, Marge. All right, Patsy, come on. We'll make another call on Hugh Warren, who owns the store. I think we can do something for him 
If he'll do something for us first. I hate to bother you at your home like this, Mr. Warren. Oh, it's perfectly all right, Mr. Carter. Perfectly all right. I hope we're not interrupting your dinner, Mr. Warren. Dinner? Why, Miss Bowen, it's after nine o'clock. Oh. Well, so it is. We've been pretty busy. Well, have you learned anything? Enough so I think we're on the right track, Mr. Warren. Good, good. We'd like a key to your store and permission to go inside tonight. I want to look around a bit. Why, I think that could be arranged. But a word of warning, Mr. Carter. This store is wired for burglar alarms. Not only the outer doors, but many places inside the store. For example, the door to the cashier's office will flash an alarm if it is entered without a key. And there are other things to look out for, too. We'll be careful, Mr. Warren. I think you'll have no trouble if you follow my directions. Now, if you have a pencil, I'll give you a list of things to watch out for. Golly, Nick. I never realized how lonesome a store like this can be after everyone's gone. Yeah. Wonder where the watchmen are. Mr. Warren said there'd be two of them here. We haven't run into either one of them yet. Well, it's positively eerie in here with just our, our two flashlights for company. I see. According to Mr. Warren's directions, we turn right here. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Hey. Lights around in here. Oh, Nick, look at all the fur coats. Dozens of them. All second-hand, Betsy. Huh? Oh, yes, so they are. But some of them are still lovely. I know I... Well, that's funny, Nick. What's funny? Remember how I fought for a minute this afternoon that Audrey Robard's coat was a new one? Yeah, what about it? Well, this coat here is her coat. The one I saw this afternoon. You sure? Positive. I took a close look at it as we went by, and I noticed this funny jagged tear on the lining. <laughs> I'd know it anywhere. Good for you, Patsy. Hmm? Now I know I'm right. What do you mean by that? He means you have good eyesight what? and an excellent memory, Miss Bowen. It's Miss Robard. Don't move, either of you. My father taught me to use a gun when I was a girl. I see Jason Dodds with you. Showing you all those coats he has in his arm, no doubt. Keep your hands up, Carter. You too, Miss Bowen. Yes, Jason and I stole those missing coats. We knew you'd find out, so we came back tonight to clean out the place. And we're going to. You can't stop us, Carter. Jason had his own keys, and he's arranged for the watchman to be in another part of the store for a while. Too bad we came in just when we did. Yes. Yeah. It's too bad for you, Carter. Jason, put down those coats and walk around behind Carter and search him. Uh, look, I, I, I... Do as I say, you fool. I know everything. We heard that much. Yes, yes, we, we've got to finish it up. Keep your hands in the air, both of you. And don't reach for your purse, Miss Bowen. I know there's probably a gun in it. Looks as if you hold all the cards, Miss Robard. Jason, stand right behind Carter. Now reach over his shoulder. He probably carries his gun in his shoulder. Uh, Nancy, cut the lights and run for it. Back to, back to the cashier's office. We left it. The there's a phone there. We can call the police. Uh, Audrey, what happened? Oh, you fool, Jason. Letting him throw you like that. I, I couldn't help it. He moved so fast. When I reached over oh, his Never shoulder, mind. They're headed for the cashier's office to phone. Well, we can stop that. The switchboard's right over there. I can even find it in the dark. And then find it. If we can stop them from calling for help, we've got them cornered. Carter? Carter, I know you're in that cashier's office. Then come and get it. Audrey, let's get out of here. Not before I take care of Carter and the girl. How? How are you going to do it? Listen, they're in the cashier's office. And that's the only door right ahead of us. Yes, but... Oh, but stop the... sniveling. We got Carter's gun. Miss Bowen dropped her handbag and I found her gun in it. Yes, That means yes, they're but... unarmed. We, we can smash the glass panel in the door of the cashier's office and get them that way. But, Audrey... Grab but... one of those chairs and throw it through the glass. Okay, I guess you're right. Here goes. <laughs> There, that does it. Carter, you can come outside and get it. Or I'll come in after you. It makes no difference to me. Nick and Patsy are trapped in a small office without weapons and with the telephone cut off. We'll see what happens in just a moment.
Once again, the makers of Old Dutch Cleanser and the entire cast and the director of your Nick Carter program join in adding their warmest Christmas wishes to the many you have already received. We hope that today has been a truly beautiful Christmas for you and that the coming new year will be filled with an abundance of pleasure, prosperity, and peace. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. Cautiously, Audrey Robard moves up to the broken glass in the door, reaches inside, and unlocks it. Jason Dodd hovers uncertainly behind her. Carter, are you coming out? All right, if you won't come out, I'm coming in. Stay beside me, Jason. There aren't many places they can hide. Please hurry. It's been at least ten minutes since I smashed that door. You were so darn careful. Take it easy. Even without a gun, Carter's still Okay, pretty... you two. <laughs> drop the guns or we'll drop you. Cop! The police! I oh. said drop those guns. In one second we start shooting. Okay. Okay, we give up. Yeah. You, Doc, kick those guns my way. All right. Uh, that's better. Nick! Hey, Nick! Are you in there? Right here, Manny. What kept you? Yeah. What kept me? Listen, it's not ten minutes since the alarm came into headquarters. <laughs> what alarm are you talking about? The alarm you sent in, Miss Robart. What? I made you smash the glass panel in the door to the cashier's office. When the glass broke, a burglar alarm went off automatically in police headquarters. You turned yourselves into the police. <laughs> All right, Nick. Give with the details. You say it was worked with second-hand coats, huh? That's it, Matty. Miss Robart would go out and buy a cheap second-hand fur coat worth practically nothing. Uh. Then when she came to the store to see Dodd, which was practically every day, she'd leave the old coat and walk out with a new mink coat. Uh-huh. She was well known in the store, so no one ever thought of suspecting her. And when she came in with the cheap coat, she'd carry it over her arm so it wouldn't show how cheap it really was. What a racket. Yeah. And Dodd would put the old coat with the used coats the store had for sale... And fix the records to account for it. And another nice new valuable mink was missing without a trace. And the shoplifters were just part of a setup to confuse us, huh, Nick? Yeah, Matty. Dodd arranged that with Bruno. The shoplifter stole some small object and mailed it to Bruno's post office box right from inside the store in previously prepared envelopes. Just so we'd think the professional shoplifters were stealing the furs. And they killed Peggy Matthews because she got wise and wanted a cut. Dodd admitted that. He killed Bruno, too. Yeah. When we connected Bruno and Peggy, I suppose Dodd was afraid of how much Bruno might know. Mm. So we had to put him out of the way, too. So he sent Patsy and you to see Mr. Warren so you'd be out of the way while he killed him. Yeah. Well, I think we better let him lock up the store now. Oh, in just a minute, Nick. Hey, Patsy, where are you going? Into the fur department. Sure, it's a woman's privilege to look at those beautiful mink coats, even if she can't have one. <laughs> A quarter. Oh, come on, come on, Patsy. You've had enough lemonade and hot dogs. Let's go right in the carousel. Oh, no. I want to have my handwriting analyzed in this machine. Handwriting analyzed? Yeah. Hey, Patsy. Remember that case down in the Smokies? Oh, do I? How could I ever forget Sheldon Corey, the man who wrote letters to his uncle just so he could forge a will? And will you ever forget how the sheriff trapped us in the cemetery when I was trying to have a look at a dead man's hands? Yeah. Wouldn't that make an exciting adventure to tell about next week? Yeah, it would at that. Good. And I'll call it the case of the perfect penman. It's been only a few short years since Delrich Margarine was first introduced. But in those years, Delrich has won many, many friends. More than any other margarine, in fact. And at this holiday season, the makers of Delrich want to thank you most sincerely. In many homes, Delrich has played an important part in your big and bountiful Christmas dinner today. We hope this has been the merriest Christmas you've ever had, and that next year's will be even better. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this same time by the Cudahy Packing Company. 
It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick and Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's transcribed adventure was written by Norman Daniels with original music played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new wonderful old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, that mention at the start of the episode that um, they were going to. Uh, that this was transcribed especially so could, people could be home with uh, with their families uh, during Christmas. I thought that was great. I just wish they would have transcribed a few more episodes. Uh, may have made the series a little less rare. It really is a good final uh, adventure for at least what we have in circulation. I really did like the way at the end that they teased the next week's adventure without the aid of an announcer which uh, I think is a little more personable and engaging. Um, it should be mentioned that Nick Carter actually had a much longer career on the radio. It aired throughout 1950, 51, 52, 53, 54, and right into the middle of 1955. However, none of those episodes are in circulation. Uh, however, Radio Gold Index catalogs the existence of many of these episodes, so they may be in the hands of private collectors somewhere just waiting to be discovered. And I certainly would enjoy hearing more uh, Nick Carter. Uh, I found this to be a fairly solid series. Yeah, it has its problems, its tropes, uh, a few plot issues, and the ever-changing relationship between Nick and Patsy. But the mysteries were generally well written, and Long Clark, I think, is just perfect as Nick Carter as this brilliant uh, detective, who even though he's a bit of a know-it-all, is a lovable know-it-all. And a very tough character, and it's definitely been entertaining bringing you this series for the past two and a half years, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Well, that will do it for now. Uh, tomorrow we'll be back with yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And coming up next week, we're going to bring you a two-part presentation of the Moonstone on Suspense. Uh, so be sure and listen to that. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook.